What harm has the poor maiden Mary done to the Jews? How can they prove that she was a whore? She did no more than bear a son whose name is Jesus. Is it such a great crime for a young wife to bear a child? Or are all who bear children to be accounted whores? What, then, is to be said about their own wives and about themselves? Are they, too, all whores and children of whores? You accursed Goyim, that is a different story. Do you not know that the Jews are Abraham's noble blood, circumcised, and kings in heaven and on earth? Whatever they say is right. If there were a virgin among the accursed Goyim as pure and holy as the angel Gabriel, and the least of these noble princes were to say that she is an arch whore and viler than the devil, it would necessarily have to be so. The fact that a noble mouth of the lineage of Abraham said this would be sufficient proof. Who dares contradict him? Conversely, any arch whore of the noble blood of the Jews, though she were as ugly as the devil himself, would still be purer than any angel, if the noble lords were pleased to say this. For the noble circumcised lords have the authority to lie, to defame, revile, blaspheme, and curse the accursed goyim as they wish. On the other hand, they are privileged to bless, to honor, praise, and exalt themselves, even if God disagrees with them. Do you suppose that a Jew is such a bad fellow? God in heaven and all the angels have to laugh and dance when they hear a Jew fart, so that you accursed Goyim may know what excellent fellows the Jews are. For how could they be so bold as to call Mary a whore, with whom they can find no fault, if they were not vested with the power to trample God and his commandment underfoot? Well and good, you and I, as accursed Goyim, wish to submit a simple illustration by means of which we, as benighted heathen, might comprehend this lofty wisdom of the noble, holy Jews, just a little. Let us suppose that I had a cousin, or another close-blood relative, of whom I knew no evil, and in whom I had never detected any evil, and other people, against whom I bore a grudge, praised and extolled her regarded her as an excellent, pious, virtuous, laudable woman, and said, This dunce is not worthy of having such a fine, honorable woman as his cousin. A she-dog or a she-wolf would be more fit for him. Then I, upon hearing such eulogies of my cousin spoken, would begin to say, against my own conscience, They are all lying. She is an arch-whore. And now I would, though lacking any proof, demand that everyone believe me, despite the fact that I was well aware of my cousin's innocence, while I, a consummate liar, was cursing all who refused to believe my lie, which I knew in my heart to be just that. Tell me, how would you regard me? Would you not feel impelled to say that I was not a human being, but a monster, a repulsive fiend, not worthy of gazing at the sun, the leaves, the grass, or any creature? Indeed, you would consider me to be possessed by devils. I should rather treat my cousin's disgrace, if I even knew of any, as though it were my own, and cover it up if it threatened to become public, just as all other people do. But although no one, including myself, knows anything but honorable things about her, I dare to step to the fore and defame my own cousin as a scoundrel, with false slander, oblivious to the fact that this shame reflects on me. That is the type of human beings, if I should call or could call them that, which these noble circumcised saints are. We Goyim, with whom they are hostile and angry, confess that Mary is not ours, but rather the Jew's cousin and blood relative, descended from Abraham. When we praise and laud her highly, they proceed to defame her viciously. If there were a genuine drop of Israelitish blood in such miserable Jews, do you not suppose they would say, well, What are we to do? Can she help it that her son provoked our ire? Why should we slander her? After all, Mary is our flesh and blood. It has undoubtedly happened before that a bad son issued from a pious mother. No, such human and responsible thoughts will not occur to these holy people. They must entertain nothing but devilish, base, lying thoughts, so that they may in that way do penance and merit the Messiah very soon, as they have, of course, merited him now for fifteen hundred years. 
They further lie and slander him and his mother by saying that she conceived him at an unnatural time. About this they are most malicious and malignant and malevolent. In Leviticus 20, Moses declares that a man must not approach a woman, nor a woman a man, during the female's menstrual uncleanness. This is forbidden on pain of the loss of life and limb, for whatever is conceived at such a time results in imperfect and infirm fruit, that is, in insane children, mental deficients, demons' offspring, changelings, and the like, people who have unbalanced minds all their lives. In this way, the Jews would defame us Christians by saying that we honor as the Messiah a person who was mentally deficient from birth or some sort of demon. These most intelligent, circumcised, highly enlightened saints regard us as such stupid and accursed goyim. Truly, these are the devil's own thoughts and words. Do you ask what prompts them to write this, or what is the cause of it? You stupid, accursed goy, why should you ask that? Does it not satisfy you to know that this is said by the noble, circumcised saints? Are you so slow to learn that such a holy people is exempt from all the decrees of God and cannot sin? They may lie, blaspheme, defame, and murder whom they will, even God himself and all his prophets. All of this must be accounted as nothing but a fine service rendered to God. Did I not tell you earlier that a Jew is such a noble, precious jewel that God and all the angels dance when he farts? And if he were to go on to drop a turd, they would nevertheless expect it to be regarded as a golden Talmud. Whatever issues from such a holy man, from the top or from the bottom, must surely be considered by the accursed Goyim to be pure holiness. For if a Jew were not so precious and noble, how would it be possible for him to despise all Christians with their Messiah and his mother so thoroughly to vilify them with such malicious and poisonous lies. If these fine, pure, smart saints could only concede to us the qualities of geese or ducks, since they refuse to let us pass for human beings. For the stupidity which they ascribe to us, I could not assign to any sow pig, which, as we know, covers herself with mire from head to foot and does not eat anything much cleaner. Alas! It cannot be anything but the terrible wrath of God, which permits anyone to sink into such abysmal, devilish, hellish, insane baseness, envy, and arrogance. If I were to avenge myself on the devil himself, I should be unable to wish him such evil and misfortune as God's wrath inflicts on the Jews, compelling them to lie and to blaspheme so monstrously in violation of their own conscience. Anyway, they have their reward for constantly giving God the lie. In his Bible, Sebastian Munster relates that a malicious rabbi does not call the dear mother of Christ Maria, but Haria, i.e. sterquilinium, a dung heap. And who knows what other villainy they may indulge in among themselves, unknown to us. One can readily perceive how the devil constrains them to the basest lies and blasphemies he can contrive. Thus they also begrudge the dear mother Mary, the daughter of David, her right name, although she has not done them any harm. If they do that, why should they not also begrudge her her life, her goods, and her honor? And if they wish and inflict all kinds of disgrace and evil on their own flesh and blood, which is innocent, and about which they know nothing evil, what do you suppose might they wish upon us a cursed goyim? Yet, they presume to step before God with such a heart and mouth that they utter worship and invoke his holy name, entreating him to return them to Jerusalem, to send them their Messiah, to kill all the Gentiles, and to present them with all the goods of the world. The only reason that God does not visit them with thunder and lightning, that he does not deluge them suddenly with fire, as he did Sodom and Gomorrah, is this— this punishment would not be commensurate with such malice. Therefore, he strikes them with spiritual thunder and lightning. As Moses writes in Deuteronomy 28, among other places, The Lord will smite you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind. Those are indeed the true strokes of lightning and thunder, madness, blindness, confusion of mind.
Although these terrible, slanderous, blasphemous lies are directed particularly against the person of our Lord and his dear mother, they are also intended for our own persons. They want to offer us the greatest affront and insult for honoring a Messiah whom they curse and malign so terribly that they do not consider him worthy of being named by them or any human being, much less of being revered. Thus we must pay for believing in him, for praising, for honoring, and for serving him. I should like to ask, however, what harm has the poor man, Jesus, done to these holy people? If he was a false teacher, as they allege, he was punished for it. For this he received his due, for this he suffered with a shameful death on the cross, for this he paid and rendered satisfaction. No accursed heathen in all the world will persecute and malign forever and ever a poor dead man who suffered his punishment for his misdeeds. How then does it happen that these most holy, blessed Jews outdo the accursed heathen? To begin with, they declare that Jerusalem was not destroyed, nor were they led into captivity for their sin of crucifying Jesus. For they claim to have done the right thing when they meted out justice to the seducer, and thus merited their Messiah. Is it the fault of the dead man, who has now met his judgment, that we Goyim are so stupid and foolish as to honor him as our Messiah? Why do they not settle the issue with us, convince us of our folly, and demonstrate their lofty, heavenly wisdom? We have never fled from them. We are still standing our ground and defying their holy wisdom. Let us see what they are able to do. For it is most unseemly for such great saints to crawl into a corner and to curse and scold in hiding. Now, as I began to ask earlier, what harm has the poor Jesus done to the most holy children of Israel that they cannot stop cursing him after his death, with which he paid his debts? Is it perhaps that he aspires to be the Messiah, which they cannot tolerate? Oh, no, for he is dead. They themselves crucified him, and a dead person cannot be the Messiah. Perhaps he is an obstacle to their return into their homeland. No, that is not the reason either, for how can a dead man prevent that? What, then, is the reason? I will tell you. As I said before, it is the lightning and thunder of Moses, to which I referred before. The Lord will smite you with madness and blindness and confusion of mind. It is the eternal fire of which the prophets speak. My wrath will go forth like fire and burn with none to quench it. Jeremiah 4. John Baptist proclaimed the same message to them after Herod had removed their scepter, saying in Luke chapter 3, His winnowing fork is in his hand, and he will clear his threshing floor and gather his wheat into his granary, but his chaff he will burn with unquenchable fire. Indeed, such fire of divine wrath we behold descending on the Jews. We see it burning, a blaze and a flame, a fire more horrible than that of Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, such devilish lies and blasphemy are aimed at the person of Christ and of his dear mother. But our person and that of all Christians are also involved. They are also thinking of us. Because Christ and Mary are dead, and because we Christians are such vile people to honor these despicable dead persons, they also assign us our special share of slander. In the first place, they lament before God that we are holding them captive in exile, and they implore him ardently to deliver his holy people and dear children from our power and the imprisonment in which we hold them. They dub us Edom and Haman with which names they would insult us grievously before God and hurt us deeply. However, it would carry us too far afield to enlarge on this. They know very well that they are lying here. If it were possible, I would not be ashamed to claim Edom as my forefather. He was the natural son of the saintly Rebekah, the grandson of the dear Sarah. Abraham was his grandfather. Isaac was his real father. Moses himself commands them to regard Edom as their brother, Deuteronomy 23. They indeed obey Moses as very true Jews. Further, they presume to instruct God and prescribe the manner in which he is to redeem them. For the Jews, these very learned saints, look upon God as a poor cobbler, equipped only with a left-footed last for making shoes. 
This is to say that he is to kill and exterminate all of us Goyim through their Messiah, so that they can lay their hands on the land, the goods, and the government of the whole world. And now a storm breaks over us with curses, defamation, and derision that cannot be expressed with words. They wish that sword and war, distress and every misfortune may overtake us accursed goyim. They vent their curses on us openly every Saturday in their synagogues and daily in their homes. They teach, urge, and train their children from infancy to remain the bitter, virulent, and wrathful enemies of the Christians. This gives you a clear picture of their conception of the fifth commandment and their observation of it. They have been bloodthirsty bloodhounds and murderers of all Christendom for more than 1,400 years in their intentions, and would undoubtedly prefer to be such with their deeds. Thus they have been accused of poisoning water and wells, of kidnapping children, of piercing them through with an awl, of hacking them in pieces, and in that way secretly cooling their wrath with the blood of Christians, for all of which they have been often condemned to death by fire. And still, God refused to lend an ear to the holy penitence of such great saints and dearest children. The unjust God lets such holy people curse, I wanted to say pray, so vehemently, in vain, against our Messiah and all Christians. He does not care to see or have anything to do either with them or with their pious conduct, which is so thickly, thickly, heavily, heavily coated with the blood of the Messiah and his Christians. For these Jews are much holier than were those in the Babylonian captivity, who did not curse, who did not secretly shed the blood of his children, nor poison the water, but who rather, as Jeremiah had instructed them, prayed for their captors, the Babylonians. The reason is that they were not as holy as the present-day Jews, nor did they have such smart rabbis as the present-day Jews have. For Jeremiah, Daniel, and Ezekiel were big fools to teach like this. They would, I suppose, be torn to shreds by the teeth of today's Jews. Now behold, what a fine, thick, fat lie they pronounce when they say that they are held captive by us. Jerusalem was destroyed over 1,400 years ago, and at that time we Christians were harassed and persecuted by the Jews throughout the world for about 300 years, as we said earlier. We might well complain that during that time they held us Christians captive and killed us, which is the plain truth. Furthermore, we do not know to the present day which devil brought them into our countries. We surely did not bring them from Jerusalem. In addition, no one's holding them here now. The country and the roads are open for them to proceed to their land whenever they wish. If they did so, we would be glad to present gifts to them on the occasion. It would be a good riddance. For they are a heavy burden, a plague, a pestilence, a sheer misfortune for our country. Proof of this is found in the fact that they have often been expelled forcibly from a country, far from being held captive in it. Thus they were banished from France, which they call Sorafath, from Obadiah, which was an especially fine nest. Very recently they were banished by our dear Emperor Charles from Spain, the very best nest of all, which they called Safarad, also on the basis of Obadiah. This year they were expelled from the entire Bohemian crown land, where they had one of the best nests in Prague. Likewise, during my lifetime, they have been driven from Regensburg, Magdeburg, and other places. If you cannot tolerate a person in a country or home, does that constitute holding him in captivity? In fact, they hold us Christians captive in our own country. They let us work in the sweat of our brow to earn money and property, while they sit behind the stove, idle away the time, fart, and roast pears. They stuff themselves, guzzle, and live in luxury, and eat from our hard-earned goods. With their accursed usury, they hold us and our property captive. Moreover, they mock and deride us, because we work and let them play the role of lazy squires at our expense and in our land. Thus they are our masters, and we are their servants, with our property, our sweat, and our labor. And by way of reward... And thanks, they curse our Lord and us. Should the devil not laugh and dance if he can enjoy such a fine paradise at the expense of us Christians? He devours what is ours through his saints, 
the Jews, and repays us by insulting us, in addition to mocking and cursing both God and man. They could not have enjoyed such good times in Jerusalem under David and Solomon with their own possessions, as they now do with ours, which they daily steal and rob. And yet they wailed that we have taken them captive. Indeed, we have captured them and hold them in captivity, just as I hold captive my gallstone, uh, my bloody tumor, and all the other ailments and misfortunes which I have to nurse and take care of with money and goods and all that I have. Alas, I wish that they were in Jerusalem with the Jews and whomever else they would like to have there. Since it has now been established that we do not hold them captive, how does it happen that we deserve the enmity of such noble and great saints? We do not call their women whores, as they do Mary, Jesus' mother. We do not call them children of whores, as they do our Lord Jesus. We do not say that they were conceived at the time of cleansing and were thus born as idiots, as they say of our Lord. We do not say that their women are haria, as they do with regard to our dear Virgin Mary. We do not curse them, but wish them well, physically and spiritually. We lodge them. We let them eat and drink with us. We do not kidnap their children and pierce them through. We do not poison their wells. We do not thirst for their blood. How then do we incur such terrible anger, envy, and hatred on the part of such great and holy children of God? There is no other explanation for this than the one cited earlier from Moses, namely, that God has struck them with, quote, madness and blindness and confusion of mind. So we are even at fault in not avenging all this innocent blood of our Lord and of the Christians, which they shed for 300 years after the destruction of Jerusalem, and the blood of the children they have shed since then, which still shines forth from their eyes and from their skin. We are at fault in not slaying them. Rather, we allow them to live freely in our midst, despite all their murdering, cursing, blaspheming, lying, and defaming. We protect and shield their synagogues, houses, life, and property. In this way, we make them lazy and secure and encourage them to fleece us boldly of our money and goods, as well as to mock and deride us with a view of finally overcoming us, killing us for all of these great sins and robbing us of our property as they daily pray and hope. Now tell me whether they do not have every reason to be the enemies of us accursed goyim, to curse us and strive for our final, complete, and eternal ruin. From all of this we Christians see, for the Jews cannot see it, what terrible wrath of God these people have incurred and still incur without ceasing, what a fire is gleaming and glowing there, and what they achieve who curse and detest Christ and his Christians. Oh, dear Christians, let us take this horrible example to heart, as St. Paul says in Romans 11, and fear God, lest we also finally fall victim to such wrath, and even worse, rather, as we said also earlier, let us honor his divine word, and not neglect the time of grace, as Muhammad and the Pope have already neglected it, becoming not much better than the Jews. What shall we Christians do with this rejected and condemned people, the Jews? Since they live among us, we dare not tolerate their conduct, now that we are aware of their lying and reviling and blaspheming. If we do, we become partakers in their lies, cursing and blasphemy. Thus we cannot extinguish the unquenchable fire of divine wrath, of which the prophets speak, nor can we convert the Jews. With prayer and the fear of God, we must practice a sharp mercy to see whether we might save at least a few from the glowing flames. We dare not avenge ourselves. Vengeance a thousand times worse than we could wish them already has them by the throat. I shall give you my sincere advice. First, set fire to their synagogues or schools and bury and cover with dirt whatever will not burn, so that no man will ever again see a stone or a cinder of them. This is to be done in honor of our Lord and of Christendom, so that God might see that we are Christians, and do not condone or knowingly tolerate such public lying, cursing, and blaspheming of his Son and of his Christians. 
for whatever we tolerated in the past unknowingly, and I myself was unaware of it, will be pardoned by God. But if we, now that we are informed, were to protect and shield such a house for the Jews, existing right before our very noses, in which they lie about, blaspheme, curse, vilify, and defame Christ and us, as was heard above, it would be the same as if we were doing all this, and even worse ourselves, as we very well know. In Deuteronomy 13, Moses writes that any city that is given to idolatry shall be totally destroyed by fire, and nothing of it shall be preserved. If he were alive today, he would be the first to set fire to the synagogues and houses of the Jews. For in Deuteronomy 4 and 12, he commanded very explicitly that nothing is to be added or subtracted from his law. And Samuel says in 1 Samuel 15 that disobedience to God is idolatry. Now, the Jews' doctrine at present is nothing but the additions of the rabbis and the idolatry of disobedience, so that Moses has become entirely unknown among them, as we said before, just as the Bible became unknown under the papacy in our day. So also, for Moses' sake, their schools cannot be tolerated. They defame him just as much as they do us. It is not necessary that they have their own free churches for such idolatry. Second, I advise that their houses also be razed and destroyed. For they pursue in them the same aims as in their synagogues. Instead, they might be lodged under a roof or in a barn, like the gypsies. This will bring home to them the fact that they are not masters in our country, as they boast, but that they are living in exile and in captivity, as they incessantly wail and lament about us before God. Third, I advise that all their prayer books and Talmudic writings, in which such idolatry, lies, cursing, and blasphemy are taught, be taken from them. Fourth, I advise that their rabbis be forbidden to teach henceforth on pain of the loss of life and limb, for they have justly forfeited the right to such an office by holding the poor Jews captive with the saying of Moses, in which he commands them to obey their teachers on penalty of death, although Moses clearly adds what they teach you in accord with the law of the Lord. Those villains ignore that part. They wantonly employ the poor people's obedience contrary to the law of the Lord, and infuse them with this poison, cursing, and blasphemy. In the same way, the Pope also held us captive, with all his declarations from Matthew 16, you are Peter, etc., inducing us to believe all the lies and deceptions that issued from his devilish mind. He did not teach us in accord with the word of God, and therefore he forfeited the right to teach. Fifth, I advise that the safe conduct on the highways be abolished completely for Jews, for they have no business in the countryside, since they are not lords, officials, tradesmen, or the like. Let them stay at home. I have heard it said that a rich Jew is now traveling across the country with twelve horses. His ambition is to become a kokba, devouring princes, lords, lands, and people with his usury, so that the great lords view it with jealous eyes. If you great lords and princes will not forbid such usurers the highway legally, some day a troop may gather against them, having learned from this booklet the true nature of the Jews and how one should deal with them and not protect their activities. For you too must not and cannot protect them unless you wish to become participants and partakers in all their abominations in the sight of God. Consider carefully what good could come from this and prevent it. Sixth, I advise that usury be prohibited to them, and that all cash and treasure of silver and gold be taken from them and put aside for safekeeping. The reason for such a measure is that, as said above, they have no other means of earning a livelihood than usury, and by it they have stolen and robbed from us all they possess. Such money should now be used in no other way than the following. Whenever a Jew is sincerely converted, he should be handed 100, 200, or 300 florins, as personal circumstances may suggest. With this, he could set himself up in some occupation for the support of his poor wife and children, and the maintenance of the old or feeble. For such evil gains are cursed if they are not put to use with God's blessing in a good 
and worthy cause. But when they boast that Moses allowed or commanded them to exact usury from strangers, citing Deuteronomy 23, apart from this they cannot adduce as much as a letter in their support. We must tell them that there are two classes of Jews or Israelites. The first comprises those whom Moses, in compliance with God's command, led from Egypt into the land of Canaan. To them he issued his law, which they were to keep in that country and not beyond it, and then only until the advent of the Messiah. The other Jews are those of the emperor and not of Moses. These date back to the time of Pilate, the procurator of the land of Judah. For when the latter asked them before the judgment seat, Then what shall I do with Jesus, who is called Christ? They all said, Crucify him, crucify him. He said to them, Shall I crucify your king? They shouted in reply, We have no king but Caesar. God had not commanded of them such submission to the emperor. They gave it voluntarily. But when the emperor demanded the obedience which was due him, they resisted and rebelled against him. Now they no longer wanted to be his subjects. Then he came and visited his subjects, gathered them in Jerusalem, and then scattered them throughout his entire empire, so that they were forced to obey him. From these the present remnant of Jews descended, of whom Moses knows nothing, nor they of him, for they do not deserve a single passage or verse of Moses. If they wish to apply Moses' law again, they must first return to the land of Canaan, become Moses' Jews, and keep Moses' laws. There they may practice usury as much as the strangers will endure from them. But since they are dwelling in and disobeying Moses in foreign countries under the emperor, they are bound to keep the emperor's laws and refrain from the practice of usury until they become obedient to Moses. For Moses' law has never passed a single step beyond the land of Canaan or beyond the people of Israel. Moses was not sent to the Egyptians, the Babylonians, or any other nation with his law, but only to the people whom he led from Egypt into the land of Canaan, as he himself testifies frequently in Deuteronomy. They were expected to keep his commandments in the land which they would conquer beyond the Jordan. Moreover, since priesthood, worship, government, with which the greater part, indeed almost all, of those laws of Moses deal, have been at an end for over 1,400 years already, it is certain that Moses' law also came to an end and lost its authority. Therefore, the imperial laws must be applied to these imperial Jews. Their wish to be Mosaic Jews must not be indulged. In fact, no Jew has been that for over 1,400 years. Seventh, I recommend putting a flail, an axe, a hoe, a spade, a distaff, or a spindle into the hands of young, strong Jews and Jewesses, and letting them earn their bread in the sweat of their brow, as was imposed on the children of Adam in Genesis 3. For it is not fitting that they should let us accursed goyim toil in the sweat of our faces while they, the holy people, idle away their time behind the stove, feasting and farting, and on top of all that, boasting blasphemously of their lordship over the Christians by means of our sweat. No one should toss out these lazy rogues by the seat of their pants. But if we are afraid that they might harm us or our wives, children, servants, cattle, etc., if they had to serve and work for us, for it is reasonable to assume that such noble lords of the world and venomous bitter worms are not accustomed to working and would be very reluctant to humble themselves so deeply before the accursed goyim. Then let us emulate the common sense of other nations such as France, Spain, Bohemia, etc., compute with them how much their usury has extorted from us, divide this amicably, but then eject them forever from the country. For as we have heard, God's anger with them is so intense that gentle mercy will only tend to make them worse and worse, while sharp mercy will reform them but little. Therefore, in any case, away with them. I hear it said that the Jews donate large sums of money and thus prove beneficial to governments. Yes, but where does this money come from? Not from their own possessions, but from that of the lords and subjects whom they plunder and rob by means of usury. 
Thus the lords are taking from their own subjects what they receive from the Jews, i.e., the subjects are obliged to pay additional taxes and let themselves be ground into the dust for the Jews, so that they may remain in the country, lie boldly and freely, blaspheme, curse, and steal. Shouldn't the impious Jews laugh up their sleeves because we let them make such fools of us and because we spend our money to enable them to remain in the country and to practice every malice? Over and above that, we let them get rich on our sweat and blood while we remain poor and they suck the marrow from our bones. If it is right for a servant to give his master or for a guest to give his own host ten florins annually, and in return to steal one thousand florins from him, then the servant or the guest will very quickly and easily get rich, and the master or the host will soon become a beggar. And even if the Jews could give the government such sums of money from their own property, which is not possible, and thereby buy protection from us, and the privilege publicly and freely to slander blaspheme, vilify, and curse our Lord Jesus Christ so shamefully in their synagogues, and in addition to which, to wish us every misfortune, namely, that we might all be stabbed to death and perish with our Haman, emperor, princes, lords, wife, and children. This would really be selling Christ our Lord, the whole of Christendom together with the whole empire and ourselves, with wife and children, cheaply and shamefully. What a great saint the traitor Judas would be in comparison with us. Indeed, if each Jew, as many as there are of them, could give 100,000 florins annually, we should nevertheless not yield them for this right to so freely malign, curse, defame, impoverish by usury one single Christian. That would still be far too cheap a price. How much more intolerable is it that we permit the Jews to purchase with our money such license to slander and curse the whole Christ and all of us, and furthermore, reward them for this with riches and make them lords, while they ridicule us and gloat in their malice? That would prove a delightful spectacle for the devil and his angels, over which they could secretly grin like a sow grinning at her litter, litter of piglets, but which would indeed merit God's great wrath. In brief, dear princes and lords, those of you who have Jews under your rule, if my counsel does not please you, find better advice so that you and we all can be rid of the unbearable devilish burden of the Jews, lest we become guilty sharers before God in their lies, their blasphemy, their defamation, and the curses which the mad Jews indulge in so freely and wantonly against the person of our Lord Jesus Christ, his dear virgin mother, all Christians, all authority, and ourselves. Do not grant them protection, safe conduct, or communion with us. Do not aid and abet them in acquiring your money or your subject's money and property by means of usury. We have enough sin in our own without this, dating back to the papacy, and we add to it daily with our ingratitude and our contempt of God's word and all his grace. So it is not necessary to burden ourselves also with these alien, shameful vices of the Jews, and, over and above it all, to pay them for it with money and property. Let us consider that we are now daily struggling with the Turks which surely calls for a lessening of our sins and a reformation of our lives. With this faithful counsel and warning, I wish to cleanse and exonerate my conscience. And you, my dear gentlemen and friends who are pastors and preachers, I wish to remind very faithfully of your official duty, so that you too may warn your parishioners concerning their eternal harm, as you know how to do, namely, that they be on their guard against the Jews and avoid them so far as possible. They should not curse them or harm their persons, however, for the Jews have cursed and harmed themselves more than enough by cursing the man, Jesus of Nazareth, Mary's son, which they unfortunately have been doing for over 1,400 years. Let the government deal with them in this respect, as I have suggested. But whether the government acts or not, let everyone at least be guided by his own conscience and form for himself a definition or image 
of a Jew. When you lay eyes on or think of a Jew, you must say to yourself, Alas, that mouth which I there behold has cursed and execrated and maligned every Saturday my dear Lord Jesus Christ, who has redeemed me with his precious blood. In addition, it prayed and pleaded before God that I, my wife and children, and all Christians might be stabbed to death and perish miserably. And he himself would gladly do this if he were able, in order to appropriate our goods. Perhaps he has spat on the ground many times this very day over the name of Jesus, as is their custom, so that the spittle still clings to his mouth and beard if he had a chance to spit. If I were to eat, drink, or talk with such a devilish mouth, I would eat or drink myself full of devils by the dish or cupful, just as I surely make myself a cohort of all the devils that dwell in the Jews and that deride the precious blood of Christ. May God preserve me from this. We cannot help it that they do not share our belief. It is impossible to force anyone to believe. However, we must avoid confirming them in their wanton lying, slandering, cursing, and defaming. Nor dare we make ourselves partners in their devilish ranting and raving by shielding and protecting them, by giving them food, drink, and shelter, or by other neighborly acts, especially since they boast so proudly and despicably when we do help and serve them that God has ordained them as lords and us as servants. For instance, when a Christian kindles their fire for them on a Sabbath, or cooks for them in an inn, whatever they want, they curse and defame and revile us for it, supposing this to be something praiseworthy, and yet they live on our wealth, which they have stolen from us. Such a desperate, thoroughly evil, poisonous, and devilish lot are these Jews, who for these 1,400 years have been and still are our plague, our pestilence, and our misfortune. Especially you pastors who have Jews living in your midst, persist in reminding your lords and rulers to be mindful of their office and of their obligation before God to force the Jews to work, to forbid usury, to check their blasphemy and their cursing. For if they punish thievery, robbery, murder, blasphemy, and other vices among the Christians, why should the devilish Jews be scot-free to commit their crimes among us and against us? We suffer more from them than the Italians do from the Spaniards, who plunder the host's kitchen, cellar, chest, and purse, and, in addition, curse him and threaten him with death. Thus the Jews, our guests, also treat us, for we are their hosts. They rob and fleece us and hang about our necks. These lazy weak weaklings and indolent bellies, they swill and feast, enjoy good times in our homes, and by way of reward they curse our Lord Jesus Christ, our churches, our princes, and all of us, threatening us and unceasingly wishing us death and every evil. Just ponder this. How does it happen that we poor Christians nourish and enrich such an idle and lazy people, such a useless, evil, pernicious people, and such blasphemous enemies of God, receiving nothing in return but their curses and defamation and every misfortune they may inflict on us or wish us? Indeed, we are as blind and unfeeling clods in this respect, as are the Jews in their unbelief, to suffer such great tyranny from these vicious weaklings, and not perceive and sense that they are our lords, yes, our mad tyrants, and that we are their captives and subjects. Meanwhile, they wail that they are our captives, and at the same time mock us, as though we had to take this from them. But... If the authorities are reluctant to use force and restrain the Jews' devilish wantonness, the latter should, as we said, be expelled from the country and be told to return to their land and their possessions in Jerusalem, where there they may lie, curse, blaspheme, defame, murder, steal, rob, practice usury, mock, and indulge in all those infamous abominations which they practice among us, and leave our government, our country, our life, and our property, much more leave our Lord the Messiah, our faith, and our church undefiled and uncontaminated with their devilish tyranny and malice. Any privileges that they may plead shall not help them, for no one can grant privileges for practicing such abominations. These cancel and abrogate all privileges. If you pastors and preachers have followed my example and have faithfully issued such warnings, 
But neither prince nor subject will do anything about it. Let us follow the advice of Christ in Matthew 10 and shake the dust from our shoes and say, We are innocent of your blood. For I observe and have often experienced how indulgent the perverted world is when it should be strict, and conversely, how harsh it is when it should be merciful. Such was the case with King Ahab, as we find recorded in 1 Kings 20. That is the way of the prince of this world and how he reigns. I suppose that the princes will now wish to show mercy to the Jews, the bloodthirsty foes of our Christian and human name, in order to earn heaven thereby. But that the Jews enmesh us, harass us, torment and distress us poor Christians in every way with the above-mentioned devilish and detestable deeds, this they want us to tolerate, and this is a good Christian deed, especially if there is any money involved which they have filched and stolen from us. What are we poor preachers to do, meanwhile? In the first place, we will believe that our Lord Jesus Christ is truthful when he declares of the Jews, who did not accept but crucified him, You are a brood of vipers and children of the devil. This is a judgment in which his forerunner, John the Baptist, concurred, although these people were his kin. Now our authorities, and all such merciful saints as wish the Jews well, will at least have to let us believe our Lord Jesus Christ, who, I am sure, has a more intimate knowledge of all hearts than do those compassionate saints. He knows that these Jews are a brood of vipers and children of the devil, that is, people who will accord us the same benefits as does their father, the devil. And by now we Christians should have learned from Scripture as well as by experience, just how much he wishes us well. I have read and heard many stories about the Jews which agree with this judgment of Christ, namely, how they have poisoned wells, made assassinations, kidnapped children, as related before. I have heard that one Jew sent another Jew, and this by means of a Christian, a pot of blood, together with a barrel of wine, in which, when drunk empty, a dead Jew was found. There are many other similar stories. For their kidnapping of children, they have often been burned at the stake or banished, as we already heard. I am well aware that they deny all of this. However, it all coincides with the judgment of Christ, which declares that they are venomous, bitter, vindictive, tricky serpents, assassins, and children of the devil, who sting and work harm stealthily wherever they cannot do it openly. For this reason, I should like to see them where there are no Christians. The Turks and other heathen do not tolerate what we Christians endure from these venomous serpents and young devils. Nor do the Jews treat any others as they do us Christians. That is what I had in mind when I said earlier that next to the devil, a Christian has no more bitter and galling foe than a Jew. There is no other to whom we accord so many benefactions, and from whom we suffer as much as we do from these base children of the devil, this brood of vipers. Now, let me commend these Jews sincerely to whoever feels the desire to shelter and feed them, to honor them, to be fleeced, robbed, plundered, defamed, vilified, and cursed by them, and to suffer every evil at their hands. These venomous serpents and devil's children, who are the most vehement enemies of Christ our Lord and of us all. And if that is not enough, let him stuff them into his mouth, or crawl into their ass and worship their holy shit. Then let him boast of his mercy, then let him boast that he has strengthened the devil and his brood for further blaspheming of our Lord Jesus, and the precious blood with which we Christians are redeemed. Then he will be a perfect Christian, filled with works of mercy, for which Christ will reward him on the day of judgment, together with the Jews, in the eternal fire of hell. That is speaking coarsely about the coarse cursing of the Jews. Others write much about this, and the Jews know very well that it is cursing, since they curse and blaspheme consciously. Let us also speak more subtly, and, as Christians, more spiritually about this. Thus, our Lord Jesus Christ says in Matthew 10, He who receives me receives him who sent me. And in Luke 10, He who rejects you rejects me, and whoever rejects me rejects him who sent me. And in John 15, He who hates me 
hates my father also. In John 5, that all may honor the Son, even as they honor the Father. He who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father who sent him, etc. These are, God be praised, clear and plain words, declaring that all that is done to the honor or dishonor of the Son is surely also done to the honor or the dishonor of God the Father himself. We Christians cannot have or countenance any doubt of this. Whoever denies, defames, and curses Jesus of Nazareth, the Blessed Virgin Mary's Son, also denies, defames, and curses God the Father himself, who created heaven and earth. But that is what the Jews do, etc. And if you say that the Jews do not believe or know this, since they do not accept the New Testament, I reply that the Jews may know or believe this or that. We Christians, however, know that they publicly blaspheme and curse God the Father when they blaspheme and curse this Jesus. Tell me, what are we going to answer God if he takes us to account now or on the day of judgment, saying, Listen, you are a Christian. You are aware of the fact that the Jews openly blasphemed and cursed my son and me. You gave them opportunity for it. You protected and shielded them so that they could engage in this without hindrance or punishment in your country, city, and house. Tell me, what will we answer to this? Of course, we accord anyone the right not to believe omissive et privatim by neglect and privately. This we leave to everyone's conscience. But to parade such unbelief as freely in churches and before our very noses, eyes, and ears, to boast of it, to sing it, to teach it, to defend it, to revile and curse the true faith, and in this way lure others to them and hinder our people, that is a far, far different story. And this is not changed by the fact that the Jews do not believe the New Testament, that they are unacquainted with it, that they pay it no heed. The fact remains that we are acquainted with it, and that we cannot acquiesce in having the Jews revile and curse it in our hearing. To witness this and keep silent is tantamount to doing so ourselves. Thus the accursed Jews encumber us with their diabolical, blasphemous, and horrible sins in our own country. It will not do for them to say at this point, we Jews care nothing about the New Testament or about the belief of the Christians. Let them express such sentiments in their own country or secretly. In our country and in our hearing, they must suppress these words or we will have to resort to other measures. These incorrigible rascals know very well that the New Testament deals with our Lord Jesus Christ, God's Son, while they claim to be unacquainted with its contents. My friend, it is not a question of what you know or what you wish to know, but of what you ought to know, what you are ob obliged to know. As it happens, not only the Jew, but all the world is obliged to know that the New Testament is God the Father's book about his Son, Jesus Christ. Whoever does not accept and honor that book does not accept and honor God the Father himself. For we read, he who rejects me rejects my father. And if the Jews do not want to know this, then, as I said, we Christians do know it. Therefore, if we ourselves do not wish to stand condemned by their sins, we cannot tolerate that the Jews publicly blaspheme and revile God the Father before our very ears by blaspheming and reviling Jesus our Lord. For as he says, he who hates me hates my father also. Similarly, we cannot tolerate their stating openly and in our hearing that they have no regard for the New Testament, but look upon it as a pack of lies. This is tantamount to saying that they care nothing for God the Father and regard him as a liar. For this is God the Father's book. It is the word about his Son, Jesus Christ. It will not avail them, but rather prejudice their case if they plead ignorance or rejection of the book. For it is incumbent on all to know God's book. He did not reveal it to have it ignored or rejected. He wants it to be known, and he excuses no one from this. It is as if a king were to instate his only son in his place and command the country to regard him as its sovereign. Although he would 
also be entitled by this right of natural inheritance. And the country as a whole readily accepted him. A few, however, hold together and band together in opposition, alleging that they know nothing about this, despite the fact that the king had, in confirmation of his will, issued seal and letters and other testimony. They still insist that they do not want to know this or respect it. The king would be obliged to take these people by the nape of the neck and throw them into a dungeon and entrust them to Master Hans, the executioner, who would teach them to say, We are now willing to acknowledge it. The alternative would be to keep them incarcerated forever, lest they contaminate with their refractory attitude those others who do not want to learn it. This is what God, too, has done. He instated his son Jesus Christ in Jerusalem, in his place, and commanded that he be paid homage, according to Psalm 2, Kiss the son, lest he be angry, and you perish in the way. Some of the Jews would not hear of this. God bore witness by the various tongues of the apostles and by all sorts of miraculous signs and cited the statements of the prophets in testimony. However, they did then what they still do now. They were obstinate and absolutely refused to give ear to it. Then came Master Hans, the executioner, the Romans, who destroyed Jerusalem, took the villains by the nape of the neck, cast them into the dungeon of exile, which they still inhabit, and in which they will remain forever, or until they say, we are willing to acknowledge it. God surely did not do this secretly, or in some nook or corner, so that the Jews would have an excuse for disregarding the New Testament without sin. As we noted above, he gave them a reliable sign through the patriarch Jacob, namely that they could confidently expect the Messiah when the scepter had departed from Judah or when the seventy weeks of Daniel had expired, or a short time after the construction of Haggai's temple, but before its destruction. He also informed them through Isaiah that when they would hear a voice in the wilderness, as happened when the scepter had departed, that is, when they heard the voice of a preacher and a prophet proclaiming, Repent, the Lord is at hand, and is himself coming. Then they should be certain that the Messiah had come. Shortly thereafter, the Messiah himself appeared on the scene, taught, baptized, and performed innumerable great miracles, not secretly, but through the entire country, prompting many to exclaim, This is the Messiah. Also, when the Messiah appears, will he do more signs than this man has done? And they themselves said, What are we to do? For this man performs many signs. If we let him go on thus, everyone will believe in him. When he was on the crucifix, they said, He saved others. He cannot save himself. Should God concede that these circumcised saints are ignorant of all this? When they already stand convicted by the four statements cited, Jacob's, Haggai's, Daniel's, and David's, all of which show that the Messiah must have come at that time. Several of their rabbis also declared that he was in the world and was begging in Rome, etc., Furthermore, he saw to it that they were warned not to be offended at his person, for in Zechariah 9 he announced that he would come to Jerusalem, quote, riding on an ass, unquote, wretched and poor, but as a propitious king who would teach peace, who would cut off the chariots, steeds, and bows. That is not rule in a worldly manner, as the mad Kokbaites these bloodthirsty Jews rave, and that this poor yet peaceful propitious king's dominion should extend to the ends of the world. That is indeed a very clear statement setting forth that the Messiah should reign in all the world without a sword, with pure peace, as a king bringing salvation. I am extremely surprised that the devil can be so powerful as to delude a person to say nothing of an entire nation which boasts of being God's people into believing something at variance with this clear text. He faithfully forewarned them, furthermore, not to be offended when they see that such a great miracle worker and poor king who had ridden on an ass would let himself be killed and crucified, for he had it proclaimed in advance. Daniel 9 and Isaiah 53, that, quote, his servant, who will startle the kings, will be smitten, 
and afflicted. But all of this will occur because, quote, God laid on him the sins of us all and wounded him for our transgressions. But he was to make himself an offering for sin, intercede for the transgressors, and by his knowledge make many to be accounted righteous. Such the text clearly states. But the son had never seen or heard anything more disgraceful than the abuse of this passage by those blasphemous Jews. They apply it to themselves in their exile. At the present, we lack the time to deal with this. Alas, should they be the ones who were smitten because of our sin, who bore our transgressions, who made us righteous, and who intercede for us, etc.? There was never a viler people than they, who with their lying, blaspheming, cursing, maligning, their idolatry, their robbery, usury, and all vices, accuse us Christians and all mankind more before God and the world than any others. By no means do they pray for us sinners, as the text says. They curse us most vehemently, as we proved earlier from Lyra and Bergensis. Their great slothfulness and malice prompt these blasphemous scoundrels to mock Scripture, God, and all the world with their impudent glosses. This they do in accord with their merit and true worth. After the crucifixion of the king, God first presented the proper signs that this Jesus was the Messiah, poor, timid, unlearned, unconsecrated fishermen who did not even have a perfect mastery of their own language, stepped forth and preached in the tongues of the whole world. All the world, heaven and earth, is still filled with wonder at this. They interpreted the writings of the prophets with power and correct understanding. In addition, they performed such signs and wonders that their message was accepted throughout the world by Jews and Gentiles. Innumerable people, both young and old, accepted it with such sincerity that they willingly suffered gruesome martyrdom because of it. This message has now endured these 1,500 years down to our day, and it will endure to the end of time. If such signs did not move the Jews of that time, what can we expect of these degenerate Jews who haughtily disdain to know anything about this story? Indeed, God who revealed these things so gloriously to all the world will see to it that they hear us Christians preach and see us keep this message, which we did not invent, but heard from Jerusalem 1,400 years ago. No enemies, no heathen, and especially no Jews, have been able to suppress it, no matter how strongly they opposed it. It would be impossible for such a thing to maintain itself if it were not of God. The Jews themselves, in their 1,500-year exile, must confess that this message has been preached in all the world before their very ears, that it was assailed by much heresy, and yet survived. Therefore God cannot be accused of having done all this secretly, or in hiding, or of never having brought it to the attention of the Jews or of any other people. For they have all persecuted it vehemently and vigorously these 1,500 years. And yet the blasphemous Jews oppose it so impudently and sneeringly, as though it had just recently been invented by a drunkard who deserves no credence. They feel free to revile and damn it with impunity, and we Christians have to offer them room and place, house and home in the bargain. We have to protect and defend them all so that they can confidently and freely revile and condemn such a word of God. And by way of reward, we let them take our money and property through their usury. No, you vile father of such blasphemous Jews, you hellish devil, these are the facts. God has preached long enough to your children, the Jews, publicly and with miraculous signs throughout the world. He has done so for almost 1,500 years now and still preaches. They were and still are obliged to obey him, but they were hardened and ever resisted, blasphemed and cursed. Therefore, we Christians, in turn, are obliged not to tolerate their wanton and conscious blasphemy, as we heard above. He who hates the Son also hates the Father. For if we permit them to do this, where we are sovereign, and protect them to enable them to do so, then we are eternally damned together with them because of their sins and blasphemies, even if we in our persons are as holy as the prophets, apostles, 
or angels. Quia faciens et consentiens pari poena. Doing and consenting deserve equal punishment. Whether doer, adviser, accomplice, consenter, or concealer, one is as pious as the other. It does not help us, and the Jews still less, that the Jews refuse to acknowledge this. As has already been said, we Christians know it, and the Jews ought to know it, having heard it together for us, or with us, for almost 1,500 years, having beheld all sorts of miracles, and having heard how this doctrine has survived by nothing but divine strength against all devils and the whole world. This is certain, borne out by such an enduring and impressive testimony in all the world, that, quote, he who does not honor the Son does not honor the Father, and that he who does not have the Son cannot have the Father. The Jews ever blaspheme and curse God the Father, the Creator of us all, just by blaspheming and cursing His Son, Jesus of Nazareth, the Blessed Virgin Mary's Son, whom God has proclaimed as His Son for 1,500 years in all the world by preaching and miraculous signs against the might and the trickery of all devils and men, and He will proclaim Him as such until the end of the world. They dub Him Hebel Vorik, that is, not merely a liar and deceiver, but lying and deception itself, viler even than the devil. We Christians must not tolerate that they practice this in their public synagogues, in their books, in their behavior, openly under our noses and within our hearing, in our own country, houses, and regimes. If we do, we together with the Jews and on their account will lose God the Father and His dear Son, who purchased us at such a cost with his holy blood, and we will be eternally lost, which God forbid. Accordingly, it must and dare not be considered a trifling matter, but a most serious one, to seek counsel against this and to save our souls from the Jews, that is, from the devil and from eternal death. My advice, as I said earlier, is, first, that their synagogues be burned down, and that all who are able toss in sulfur and pitch. It would be good if someone could also throw in some uh, hellfire. That would demonstrate to God our serious resolve and be evidence to all the world that it was in ignorance that we tolerated such houses, in which the Jews have reviled God, our dear Creator and Father, and His Son, most shamefully, up till now, but that we have now given them their due reward. Second, that all their books, their prayer books, their Talmudic writings, and also the entire Bible be taken from them, not leaving them one leaf, and that these be preserved for those who may be converted. For they use all of the books to blaspheme the Son of God, that is, God the Father himself, creator of heaven and earth, as was said above, and they will never use them differently. Third, that they be forbidden on pain of death to praise God, to give thanks, to pray, and to teach publicly among us and in our country. They may do this in their own country, or wherever they can, without our being obliged to hear it or know it. The reason for this prohibition is that their praise, thanks, prayer, and doctrine are sheer blasphemy, cursing, and idolatry, because their heart and mouth call God the Father, Hebel Vorik, as they call His Son, our Lord Jesus, this. For as they name and honor the Son, thus they also name and honor the Father. It does not help them to use many fine words and to make much ado about the name of God. For we read, You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Just as it did little avail their ancestors at the time of the kings of Israel that they bore God's name, yet called him Baal. Fourth, that they be forbidden to utter the name of God within our hearing. For we cannot with a good conscience listen to this or tolerate it, because their blasphemous and accursed mouths and hearts call God's son Hebel Vorik, and thus also call his father that. He cannot and will not interpret this otherwise, just as we Christians, too, cannot interpret it otherwise. We who believe 
that however the Son is named and honored, thus also the Father is named and honored. Therefore, we must not consider the mouth of the Jews as worthy of uttering the name of God within our hearing. He who hears this name from a Jew must inform the authorities, or else throw sow dung at him when he sees him, and chase him away. And may no one be merciful and kind in this regard, for God's honor and the salvation of us all, including that of the Jews, are at stake. And if they, or someone else in their behalf, were to suggest that they do not intend any such great evil, or that they are not aware that with such blaspheming and cursing, they are blaspheming and cursing God the Father, alleging that though they blaspheme Jesus and his Christians, they nonetheless praise and honor God most highly and beautifully. We answer, as we have done before, that if the Jews do not want to admit this or try to put a better face on it, we Christians at least are bound to admit it. The Jews' ignorance is not to be excused since God has had this proclaimed for almost 1,500 years. They are obliged to know it, and God demands this knowledge of them. For if anyone who hears God's words for 1,500 years still constantly remarks, I do not want to acknowledge this, his ignorance will provide a very poor excuse. He thereby really incurs a sevenfold guilt. To be sure, they did not know at that time that it was God's word, but now they have been informed of it these 1,500 years. They have witnessed great signs, yet they have raged against this, and because of it lived in such exile for 1,500 years. All right, let them even now hear and believe it, and all will be simple. If they refuse, it is certain that they will never acknowledge it, but are bent on cursing it forever, as their forebears have done for these 1,500 years. So we Christians, who do acknowledge it, cannot tolerate or take upon our conscience their willful, everlasting ignorance and blasphemy in our midst. Let them wander back to their country, be ignorant, and blaspheme there as long as they can, and not burden us with their wicked sins. But what will happen even if we do burn down the Jews' synagogues and forbid them publicly to praise God, to pray, to teach, to utter God's name? They will still keep doing it in secret. If we know that they are doing this in secret, it is the same as if they were doing it publicly. For our knowledge of their secret doings and our toleration of them implies that they are not secret after all, and thus our conscience is encumbered with it before God. So let us beware. In my opinion, the problem must be resolved thus. If we wish to wash our hands of the Jews' blasphemy and not share in their guilt, we have to part company with them. They must be driven from our country. Let them think of their fatherland. Then they need no longer wail and lie before God against us that we are holding them captive. Nor need we then any longer complain that they are burdening us with their blasphemy and their usury. This is the most natural and the best course of action, which will safeguard the interests of both parties. But since they are loath to quit the country, they will boldly deny everything and will also offer the government money enough for permission to remain here. Woe to those who accept such money, and accursed be that money, which they have stolen from us so damnably through usury. They deny just as brazenly as they lie. And wherever they can secretly curse, poison, or harm us Christians, they do so without any qualms of conscience. If they are caught in the act, or charged with something, they are bold enough to deny it impudently, even to the point of death, since they do not regard as us worthy of being told the truth. In fact, these holy children of God consider any harm they can wish or inflict on us as a great service to God. Indeed, if they had the power to do so to us, what we are able to do to them, not one of us would live for an hour. But since they lack the power to do this publicly, they remain our daily murderers and bloodthirsty foes in their hearts. Their prayers and curses furnish evidence of that, as do the many stories which relate their torturing of children and all sorts of crimes for which they have often been burned at the stake or banished. Therefore, I firmly believe that they say and practice far worse things secretly than the histories and others record about them, meanwhile relying on their denials and on their money. 
But even if they could deny all else, they cannot deny that they curse us Christians openly, not because of our evil life, but because we regard Jesus as the Messiah, and because they view themselves as our captives, although they know very well that the latter is a lie, and that they are really the ones who hold us captive in our own country by means of usury, and that everyone would gladly be rid of them. Because they curse us, they also curse our Lord. And if they curse our Lord, they also curse God the Father, the creator of heaven and earth. Thus, their lying cannot avail them. Their cursing alone convicts them, so that we are indeed compelled to believe all the evil things written about them. Undoubtedly, they do more and viler things than those which we know and discover. For Christ does not lie or deceive us when he adjudges them to be serpents and children of the devil, that is, his and all his followers, murderers and enemies, wherever they find it possible. If I had power over the Jews, as our princes and cities have, I would deal severely with their lying mouths. They have one lie with which they work great harm among their children and their common folk, and with which they slander our faith so shamefully. Namely, they accuse us and slander us among their people, declaring that we Christians worship more than one God. Here they vaunt and pride themselves without measure. They beguile their people with the claim that they are the only people, in contrast to all the Gentiles, who worship no more than one God. Oh, how cocksure they are about all this! Even though they are aware that they are doing us an injustice and are lying on this point as malicious and wicked scoundrels, even though they have heard for 1,500 years, and still hear, that all of us Christians disavow this, they still stuff their ears shut like serpents and deliberately refuse to hear us, but rather insist that their venomous lies about us must be accepted by their people as the truth. This they do even though they read in our writings that we agree with Moses' words in Deuteronomy 6. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one God, and that we confess publicly and privately with our hearts, tongues, and writings, our life and our death, that there is but one God, of whom Moses writes here, and whom the Jews themselves call upon. I say, even if they know this, and have heard it, and read all about it for almost 1,500 years, it is of no avail, their lies must still stand, and we Christians have to tolerate their slander that we worship many gods. Consequently, if I had power over them, I would assemble their scholars and their leaders, and order them, on pain of losing their tongues down to the root, to convince us Christians within eight days of the truth of their assertions, and to pr prove this blasphemous lie against us to the effect that we worship more than one true God. If they succeeded, we would all on the selfsame day become Jews and be circumcised. If they failed, they should stand ready to receive the punishment they deserve for such shameful, malicious, pernicious, and venomous lies. For thanks be to God, we are, after all, not such ducks, clods, or stones that these most intelligent rabbis, these senseless fools, think us that we do not know one God and many gods cannot truly be believed in simultaneously. Neither Jew nor devil will in any way be able to prove that our belief that the one eternal Godhead is composed of three persons implies that we believe in more than one God. If the Jews maintain that they cannot understand how three persons can be one God, why then must their blasphemous, accursed, lying mouths deny, condemn, and curse what it does not understand? Such a mouth should be punished for two reasons. In the first place, because it confesses that it does not understand this, in the second place, because it nevertheless blasphemes something which it confesses it does not understand. Why do they first not ask? Indeed, why have they heard it for 1,500 years and yet refuse to learn or understand it? Therefore, such lack of understanding cannot help or excuse them, nor us Christians, if we tolerate this any longer from them. As already said, we must force them to prove their lies about us or suffer the consequences. For he who slanders and maligns us as being idolatrous in this respect, slanders and maligns Christ, that is, God himself, as an idol. 
For it is from him that we learned and received this, as his eternal word and truth, confirmed mightily by signs and confessed and taught now for fifteen hundred years. No person has yet been born, or will ever be born, who can grasp or comprehend how foliage can sprout from wood or a tree, or how grass can grow forth from stone or earth, or how any creature can be begotten. Yet these filthy, blind, hardened liars presume to fathom and to know what is happening outside and beyond the creature in God's hidden, incomprehensible, inscrutable, and eternal essence. Though we ourselves can grasp only with difficulty and with weak faith what has been revealed to us about this in veiled words, they give vent to such terrible blasphemy over it as to call our faith idolatrous, which is to reproach and defame God himself as an idol. We are convinced of our faith and doctrine, and they too ought to understand it, having heard for fifteen hundred years that it is by God and from God through Jesus Christ. If these vulgar people had expressed themselves more mildly and said, The Christians worship one God, and not many gods, and we are lying and doing the Christians an injustice when we allege that they are worshiping more than one God, though they do believe that there are three persons in the Godhead, we cannot understand this, but are willing to let the Christians follow their convictions, etc. That would have been sensible. But now they proceed, impelled by the devil, to fall into this like filthy sows, fall into the trough, defaming and reviling what they refuse to acknowledge and to understand. Without further ado, they declare, We Jews do not understand this and do not want to understand it. Therefore it follows that it is wrong and idolatrous. These are the people to whom God has never been God, but a liar in the person of all the prophets and apostles, no matter how much God had these preached to them. The result is that they cannot be God's people, no matter how much they teach, clamor, and pray. They do not hear God, so he, in turn, does not hear them. As Psalm 18 says, With the crooked thou dost show thyself perverse. The wrath of God has overtaken them. I am loath to think of this, and it has not been a pleasant task for me to write this book, being obliged to resort now to anger, now to satire, in order to avert my eyes from the terrible picture which they present. It has pained me to mention their horrible blasphemy concerning our Lord and his dear mother, which we Christians are grieved to hear. I can well understand what St. Paul meant in Romans 10 when he says that he is saddened as he considers them. I think that every Christian experiences this when he reflects seriously, not on the temporal misfortunes in exile which the Jews bemoan, but on the fact that they are condemned to blaspheme, curse, and vilify God himself and all that is God's for their eternal damnation, and that they refuse to hear and acknowledge this, but regard all of their doings as zeal for God. O oh God, Heavenly Father, relent and let your wrath over them be sufficient, and come to an end, for the sake of your dear Son. Amen. I wish, and I ask, that our rulers who have Jewish subjects exercise a sharp mercy toward these wretched people, as suggested above, to see whether this might not help, though it is doubtful. They must act like a good physician who, when gangrene has set in, proceeds without mercy to cut saw, and burn flesh, veins, bone, and marrow. Such a procedure must also be followed in this instance. Burn down their synagogues. Forbid all that I enumerated earlier. Force them to work and deal harshly with them, as Moses did in the wilderness, slaying three thousand, lest the whole people perish. They, surely, do not know what they are doing. Moreover, as people possessed, they do not wish to know it, hear it or learn it. Therefore it would be wrong to be merciful and confirm them in their conduct. If this does not help, we must drive them out like mad dogs, so that we do not become partakers of their abominable blasphemy and all their other vices, and thus merit God's wrath and be damned with them. I have done my duty. Now let everyone see to his. I am exonerated. Finally, I wish to say this for myself.
If God were to give me no other Messiah than such as the Jews wish and hope for, I would much, much rather be a sow than a human being. I will cite you a good reason for this. The Jews ask no more of their Messiah than that he be a kokba, and worldly king, who will slay us Christians and share out the world among Jews and make them lords, and who finally will die like other kings and his children after him. For thus declares a rabbi, You must not suppose that it will be different at the time of the Messiah than it has been since the creation of the world, etc. That is, there will be days and nights, years and months, summer and winter, seed time and harvest, begetting and dying, eating and drinking, sleeping, growing, digesting, eliminating. All will take its course as it does now. Only the Jews will be the masters and will possess all the world's goods, gold, joys, and delights, while we Christians will be their servants. This coincides entirely with the thoughts and teachings of Muhammad. He kills us Christians, as the Jews would like to do, occupies the land, and takes over our property, our joys, and pleasures. If he were a Jew, and not an Ishmaelite, the Jews would have accepted him as the Messiah long ago, or they would have made him the Kokba. Even if I had all of that, or if I could become the ruler of Turkey, or the Messiah for whom the Jews hope, I would still prefer being a sow. For what would all of this benefit me if I could not be secure in its possession for a single hour? Death, that horrible burden and plague of all mankind, would still threaten me. I would not be safe from him. I would have to fear him every moment. I would still have to quake and tremble before hell and the wrath of God. And I would know no end of all of this, but would have to expect it forever. The tyrant Dionysius illustrated this well when he placed a person who praised his good fortune at the head of a richly laden table. Over his head he suspended an unsheathed sword attached to a silk thread, and below him he put a red-hot fire, saying, Eat and be merry, etc. That is the sort of joy such a Messiah would dispense. And I know that anyone who has ever tasted of death's terror or burden would rather be a sow than bear this forever and ever. For a sow lies down on her feather bed, on the street, or on a dung heap. She rests securely, snores gently, sleeps sweetly, fears neither king nor lord, neither death nor hell, neither the devil nor God's wrath, and lives entirely without care so long as she has her bran. And if the emperor of Turkey were to draw near with all his might and his wrath, she in her pride would not move a bristle for his sake. If someone were to rouse her, she, I suppose, would grunt and say, if she could talk, You fool, why are you raving? You are not one-tenth as well off as I am. Not for an hour do you live as securely, as peacefully, and tranquilly, as I do constantly. Nor would you even if you were ten times as great or rich. In brief, no thought of death occurs to her, for her life is secure and serene. And if the butcher performs his job with her, she probably imagines that a stone or a piece of wood is pinching her. She never thinks of death, and in a moment she's dead. Neither before, during, nor in death did she feel death. She feels nothing but life, nothing but everlasting life. No king, not even the Jews' Messiah, will be able to emulate her, nor will any person, however great, rich, holy, or mighty he might be. She never ate of the apple which taught us wretched men in paradise the difference between good and evil. What good would the Jew's Messiah do to me if he were unable to help a poor man like me in the face of this great and horrible lack and grief and make my life one-tenth as pleasant as that of a sow? I would say, Dear Lord God, keep your Messiah, or give him to whoever will have him. Instead, make me a sow. For it is better to be a live sow than a man who is eternally dying. Yea, as Christ says, it would have been better for that man if he had not been born. However, if I had a Messiah who could remedy this grief, so that I would no longer have to fear death, but would be always and eternally sure of life, and able to play a trick on the devil and death, and no longer have to tremble before the wrath of God, 
Then my heart would leap for joy and be intoxicated with sheer delight. Then would a fire of love for God be enkindled, and my praise and thanks would never cease, even if he would not, in addition, give me gold, silver, or other riches. All the world would nonetheless be a genuine paradise for me, though I lived in a dungeon. That is the kind of Messiah we Christians have, and we thank God, the Father of all mercy, with the full, overflowing joy of our hearts, gladly and readily forgetting all the sorrow and harm which the devil wrought for us in paradise. For our loss has been richly compensated for. All has been restored to us through the Messiah. Filled with such joy, the apostles sang and rejoiced in dungeons and amid all misfortunes, as did even young girls, such as Agatha, Lucia, etc. The wretched Jews, on the other hand, who rejected this Messiah, have languished and perished since that time in anguish of heart, in trouble, trembling, wrath, impatience, malice, blasphemy, and cursing, as we read in Isaiah 65. Behold, my servants shall sing for gladness of heart, but you shall cry out for pain of heart, and shall wail for anguish of spirit. You shall leave your name to my chosen for a curse, and the Lord God will slay you, but his servants he will call by a different name. And in the same chapter we read, I was ready to be sought by those who did not ask for me. I was ready to be found by those who did not seek me. I said, Here am I. Here am I, to a nation that did not call on my name, that is, who were not my people. I spread out my hands all the day long to a rebellious people. We, indeed, have such a Messiah, who says to us in John 11, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live, and whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. And in John 8, Verily, verily, I say unto you, that if any man keeps my word, he will never see death. The Jews and the Turks care nothing for such a Messiah. And why should they? They must have a Messiah from the fool's paradise, who will satisfy their stinking bellies, and who will die together with them like a cow or a dog. Nor do they need him in the face of death. For they themselves are holy enough with their penitence and piety to step before God and attain this and everything. Only the Christians are such fools and timid cowards who stand in such awe of God, who regard their sin and his wrath so highly that they do not venture to appear before the eyes of his divine majesty without a mediator or a messiah to represent them and to sacrifice himself for them. The Jews, however, are holy and valiant heroes and knights who dare to approach God themselves without mediator or messiah and ask for and receive all they desire. Obviously, the angels and God himself must rejoice whenever a Jew condescends to pray. Then the angels must take this prayer and place it as a crown on God's divine head. We have witnessed this for 1,500 years. So highly does God esteem the noble blood and circumcised saints because they can call his son Hebel Vorik. Furthermore, not only do we foolish, craven Christians and accursed Goyim regard our Messiah as so indispensable for delivering us from death through himself and without our holiness, but we wretched people are also afflicted with such great and terrible blindness as to believe that he needs no sword or worldly power to accomplish this. For we cannot comprehend how God's wrath, sin, death, and hell can be banished with the sword. Since we observe that from the beginning of the world to the present day, death has not cared a fig for the sword. It has overcome all emperors, kings, and whoever wields a sword as easily as if it overcomes the weakest infant in the cradle. In this respect, the great seducers, Isaiah, Jeremiah, and all the other prophets do us great harm. They beguile us mad goyim with their false doctrine, saying that the kingdom of the Messiah will not bear the sword. Oh, that the holy rabbis and the chivalrous bold heroes of the Jews would come to our rescue here and extricate us from these abominable errors. For when Isaiah too prophesies concerning the Messiah, 
that the Gentiles shall come to the house and mountain of the Lord, and let themselves be taught. For undoubtedly they do not expect to be murdered with the sword. In this case they would surely not approach, but would stay away. He says, He, the Messiah, shall judge between the nations, and shall decide for many peoples, and they shall beat their swords into plowshares, and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war any more. Similar sorcery is also practiced upon us poor Goyim in Isaiah 11. Quote, they shall not hurt or destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord. We poor blind Goyim cannot conceive of this, quote, knowledge of the Lord as a sword, but as the instructions by which one learns to know God. Our understanding agrees with Isaiah 2, cited above, which also speaks of the knowledge which the Gentiles shall pursue. For knowledge does not come by the sword, but by teaching and hearing, as we stupid goyim assume. Likewise, Isaiah 53, By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, that is, by teaching them and by their hearing him, and believing in him. What else my, might his knowledge mean? In brief, the knowledge of the Messiah must come by preaching. The proof of this is before your eyes, namely that the apostles used no spear nor sword, but solely their tongues, and their example has been followed in all the world now for 1,500 years by all the bishops, pastors, and preachers, and is still being followed just see whether the pastor wields sword or spear when he enters the church, preaches, baptizes, administers the sacrament, when he retains and remits sin, when he restrains evildoers, when he comforts the godly, when he teaches, helps, and nurtures everyone's soul. Does he not do all of this exclusively with the tongue or with words? And the congregation, likewise, brings no sword or spear to such a ministry, but only its ears. And consider the miracles. The Roman Empire and the whole world abounded with idols to which the Gentiles adhered. The devil was mighty and defended himself vigorously. All swords were against it, and yet the tongue alone purged the entire world of all these idols without a sword. It also exercised innumerable devils, raised the dead, healed all types of diseases, and snowed and rained down sheer miracles. Thereafter it swept away all heresy and error, and it still does daily before our eyes. And further, this is the greatest miracle. It forgives and blots out all sin, creates happy, peaceful, patient hearts, devours death, locks the doors of hell, and opens the gate of heaven, and gives eternal life. Who can enumerate all the blessings affected by God's word? In brief, it makes all who hear and believe it children of God and heirs of the kingdom of heaven. Do you not call this a kingdom, power, might, dominion, glory? Yes, most certainly, this is a comforting kingdom and the true chemdath of all the Gentiles. And should I, in company with the Jews, desire or accept bloodthirsty kokba in place of such a kingdom? As I said, in such circumstances, I would rather be a sow than a man. All the writings of the prophets agree fully with this interpretation, that the nations, both Jew and Gentiles, flocked to Shiloh after the scepter had been wrested from Judah, as Jacob says in Genesis 49. Likewise, that the seventy weeks of Daniel are fulfilled, that the temple of Haggai is destroyed, but the house and throne of David have remained until the present time and will endure forever. On the other hand, according to the mischievous denial, lying, and cursing of the Jews, whom God has rejected. This is not the meaning of these passages, much less has it been fulfilled. To speak first of the saying of Jacob in Genesis 49, we heard before what idle and senseless foolishness the Jews have invented regarding it, yet without hitting upon any definite meaning. But if we confess our Lord Jesus and let him be the Shiloh, or Messiah, all agrees, coincides, rhymes, and harmonizes beautifully and delightfully, for he appeared promptly on the scene at the time of Herod, after the scepter had departed from Judah. He initiated his rule of peace 
without a sword, as Isaiah and Zechariah had prophesied. And all the nations gathered about him, both Jews and Gentiles, so that on one day in Jerusalem three thousand souls became believers. And many members of the priesthood and of the princes of the people also flocked to him, as Luke records in Acts 3 and 4. For more than 100 years after Jesus' resurrection, that is, from the 18th year of the reign of Emperor Tiberius until the 18th year of the reign of Emperor Hadrian, who inflicted the second and last bloodbath of the Jews, who defeated Kokhba and drove the Jews utterly and completely from their country, there were always bishops in Jerusalem from the tribe of the children of Israel, all of whom are Eusebius mentions by name in Ecclesiastical History, Book 4, Chapter 5. He begins with St. James the Apostle and enumerates about 15 of them, all of whom preached the gospel with great diligence, performed miracles, and lived a holy life, converting many thousands of Jews and children of Israel to their promised Messiah, who had now appeared. Jesus of Nazareth. Apart from these, there were the Jews living in the Diaspora who were converted together with the Gentiles by St. Paul, other apostles, and their disciples. This was accomplished despite the fact that the other faction, the blind and penitent Jews, the fathers of the present-day Jews, raved, raged, and ranted against it without let-up and without ceasing, and shed much blood of members of their own race, both within their own country and abroad among the Gentiles, as was related earlier also of Kokhba. After Hadrian had expelled the Jews from their country, however, it was necessary to choose the bishops in Jerusalem from the Gentiles, who had become Christians, for the Jews were no longer found or tolerated in the country because of Kokhba and his rebellious followers, who gave the Romans no rest. Yet the other, pious, converted Jews who lived dispersed among the Gentiles, converted many of the children of Israel, as we gather from the epistles of St. Paul and from the histories. But these always and everywhere suffered persecution at the hands of the Kokhbites, so that the pious children of Israel had no worse enemies than their own people. This is true today in the instance of converted Jews. The Gentiles all over the world now also gathered about these pious converted children of Israel. This they did in great numbers and with such zeal that they gave up not only their idols and their own wisdom, but also forsook wife and child, friends, goods, honor, life and limb for the sake of it. They suffered everything that the devil and all the other Gentiles, as well as the mad Jews, could contrive. For all of that, they did not seek a kokba, nor the Gentiles' gold, silver, possessions, dominion, land, or people. They sought eternal life, a life other than this temporal one. They were poor and wretched voluntarily, and yet were happy and content. They were not embittered or vindictive, but kind and merciful. They prayed for their enemies, and, in addition, performed many and great miracles. That has lasted uninterruptedly from that time on down to the present day, and it will endure to the end of the world. It is a great, extraordinary, and wonderful thing that the Gentiles in all the world accepted, without sword or coercion, with no temporal benefits accruing to them, gladly and freely, a poor man of the Jews as the true Messiah, one whom his own people had crucified, condemned, cursed, and persecuted without end. They did and suffered so much for his sake, and forsook all idolatry, just so they might live with him eternally. This has been going on now for 1,500 years. No worship of a false god ever endured so long, nor did all the world suffer so much because of it or cling so firmly to it. And I suppose one of the strongest proofs is found in the fact that no other god ever withstood such hard opposition as the Messiah, against whom alone all other gods and peoples have raged, and against whom they all acted in concert, no matter how varied they were, or how they otherwise disagreed. Whoever is not moved by this miraculous spectacle quite deserves to remain blind, or to become an accursed Jew. We Christians perceive that these events are in agreement with the statement of Jacob found in Genesis 49. To the Shiloh, or Messiah, 
after the scepter has dropped from the hands of Judah, shall be the obedience of the peoples. We have the fulfillment of this before our eyes. The peoples, that is, not only the Jews, but also the Gentiles, are in perfect accord in their obedience to this Shiloh. They have become one people, that is, Christians. One cannot mention or think of anyone to whom this verse of Jacob applies and refers so fittingly as to our dear Lord Jesus. It would have had to be someone who appeared just after the loss of the scepter, or else the Holy Spirit lied through the mouth of the Holy Patriarch Jacob, and God forgot his promise. May the devil say that, or anyone who wishes to be an accursed Jew. Likewise, the verse regarding the everlasting house and throne of David fits no other than this our Messiah, Jesus of Nazareth. For subsequent to the rule of the kings from the tribe of Judah, and since the days of Herod, we cannot think of any son of David who might have sat on his throne, or still occupies it today, quote, to preserve his throne eternally, unquote. Yet that is what had to take place, and still must take place, since God promised it with an oath. But when this son of David arose from the dead, many, many thousands of children of Israel rallied about him, both in Jerusalem and throughout the world, accepting him as their king and Messiah, and as the true seed of Abraham and of their lineage. These were, and still are, the house, the kingdom, the throne of David, for they are the descendants of the children of Israel and the seed of Abraham, over whom David was king. That they have now died and lie buried does not matter. They are nonetheless his kingdom and his people before him. They are dead to us and to the world, but to him they are alive and not dead. It is natural that the blind Jews are unaware of this, for he who is blind sees nothing at all. We Christians, however, know that he says in John 8 and in Matthew 22, Abraham is alive. Also in John 11, he who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. Thus David's house and throne are firmly established. There is a son occupying it eternally, who never dies, nor does he ever let die those who are of his kingdom or who accept him in true faith as king. That marks the true fulfillment of this verse, which declares that David's throne shall be eternal. Now let all the devils and Jews, Turks, and whoever wants to concern himself, with it, also name one or more sons of David, to whom this verse regarding the house of David applies so precisely and beautifully since the time of Herod, and we shall be ready to praise them. To such kingdom and throne of David we Gentiles belong, along with all who have accepted this Messiah and son of David as king with the same faith, and who continue to accept him to the end of the world and in eternity. Jacob's saying in Genesis 49 states, To him shall be the obedience of the peoples. This means not only one nation, such as the children of Israel, but also whatever others are called nations. And later we read in Genesis 22, In thy seed shall all the nations of the earth bless themselves. In this verse we find the term goyim which in the Bible commonly means the Gentiles, except where the prophets also call the Jews this in a strong tone of contempt. To summarize, the blessing of God through the seed of Abraham shall not be confined to his physical descendants, but shall be disseminated among all the Gentiles. That is why God himself calls Abraham, quote, father of a multitude of nations. There are many more such sayings in Scripture. The reason that Scripture calls this kingdom David's throne and that it calls the King Messiah David's seed is found in the fact that this kingdom of David and the King Messiah did not come from the Gentiles to the children of Abraham and Israel, but came from the children of Abraham and Israel, as the Lord himself says in John 4, salvation is from the Jews. Even if we are all descended from Adam and partake in the same birth and blood, nevertheless, all other nations were shunted aside and solely Abraham's seed was selected as the nation from which the Messiah would come. After Abraham, only Isaac. After Isaac, only Jacob. After Jacob, only Judah. After Judah, 
only David were chosen, and the other brothers, each in his turn, were pushed aside and not chosen as the lineage from which the Messiah was to come. But everything, all things, happened for the sake of the Messiah. Therefore the whole seed of Abraham, especially those who believed in this Messiah, were highly honored by God. As St. Paul says in Acts 13, God made the people great. For it surely is a great honor and distinction to be able to boast of being the Messiah's relative and kin. The closer the relationship, the greater the honor. However, this boasting must not stem from the idea that Abraham's and his descendants' lineage is worthy of such honor, for that would nullify everything. It must be based rather on the fact that God chose Abraham's flesh and blood for this purpose out of sheer grace and mercy, although it surely deserved a far different lot. We Gentiles, too, have been honored very highly by being made partakers of the Messiah and the kingdom, and by enjoying the blessing promised to Abraham's seed. But if we should boast as though we were deserving of this, and not acknowledge that we owe it to sheer, pure mercy, giving God alone the glory, all would be spoiled and lost. It is as said in 1 Corinthians 4, What have you that you did not receive? If then you received it, why do you boast as if it were not a gift? Thus the dear son of David, Jesus Christ, is also our King and Messiah, and we glory in being his kingdom and people, just as much as David himself and all children of Israel and Abraham. For we know that he has been instated as Lord, King, and Judge over the living and the dead. If we live, we live to the Lord, and if we die, we die to the Lord. That is, we will also live after death, as we just heard, and as St. Paul preaches in Romans 14. We look for no bloodthirsty kokba in him, but the true Messiah, who can give life and salvation. That is what is meant by a son of David sitting on his throne eternally. The blind Jews and Turks know nothing at all of this. May God have mercy on them, as he has had and will have on us. Amen. Neither can one produce a Messiah to whom the statement in Daniel 9 applies other than Jesus of Nazareth, even if this drives the devil with all his angels and Jews to madness. For we heard before how lame the lies of the Jews regarding King Cyrus and King Agrippa are. However, things did come to pass in accord with the words of the angel Gabriel, and we see the fulfillment before our eyes. Seventy weeks of years, he says, are decreed concerning your people and your holy city. He does not mention the city by name, Jerusalem, but he simply says your holy city. Nor does he say God's people, but simply your people. For this people's and this city's holiness are to terminate after the expiration of the seventy weeks. In its place a new people, a new Jerusalem, and a different holiness would arise, in which one would no longer have to propitiate sin annually by sacrifice, worship, and holiness in the temple, and yet never become righteous and perfectly holy, because the atonement had to be repeated and sought anew by sacrifice every year. Rather, the Messiah would bring eternal righteousness, make misdeeds of no effect, check transgressions, atone for sin, fulfill prophecies and visions, etc., where sin had been forever removed and eternal righteousness is found. Their sacrifice for sin or for righteousness is no longer required. Why should one sacrifice for sin if it no longer exists? Why should one seek righteousness by service to God, if this righteousness is already at hand. But if sacrifice and worship are no longer necessary, of what use are priests and temple? If priests and temple are no longer necessary, why a people and city who are served by them? It must develop into a new people and city which no longer needs such priests, temple, sacrifice, and worship. Or it must be laid low and destroyed, together with the useless temple and worship, priests, and sacrifice. For the seventy weeks pronounce the final judgment and put an end to them, together with city and temple, priests, sacrifice, and worship. The Christian Church, 
composed of Jews and Gentiles, is such a new people and a new Jerusalem. This people knows that sin has been removed entirely by Jesus Christ, that all prophecy has been fulfilled and eternal righteousness established, for he who believes in him is eternally righteous, and all his sins are forever made of no effect. They are atoned for, they are forgiven, as the New Testament, especially St. Peter and St. Paul, strongly emphasizes. We no longer hear it said, whoever offers guilt offerings or sin offerings or other offerings in Jerusalem becomes righteous or has atoned for his sin. But now we hear, he who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. So no matter where in the wide world he may be, he need not travel to Jerusalem. No, Jerusalem has come to him. David, too, proclaimed this in Psalm 40. Sacrifice and offering thou dost not desire, but thou hast given me an open ear, that is, the ears of the world, that they might hear and believe, and thus be saved without sacrifice, temple, and priests. Burnt offering and sin offering thou hast not required. Then I said, Lo, I come. In the volume of the book it is written of me. I delight to do thy will, O my God. Indeed, this is the Messiah who brought righteousness through his will and obedience. This is the message of the books of Moses and of all the prophets. Thus also Gabriel says that the sacrifice will not be adequate. He declares that the Messiah shall be cut off and have nothing. Of what will he have nothing? Find out about what he is talking. He is speaking to Daniel about his people and his holy city. He will have none of these, so that their holiness will no longer be with him and in him. Thus Psalm 16 says, I do not want their libations of blood, nor will I take their names upon my lips. So also we read in Isaiah 33, the people who will dwell in the new Jerusalem will be called Nesu Awon, Lavetus Peccato, a people forgiven of all sins. And Jeremiah 32 also promises another, a new covenant, in which not Moses with his covenant shall reign, but rather, as he says, I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. This is indeed a covenant of grace, of forgiveness, of remission of all sins eternally. That cannot, of course, be affected by the sword, as the bloodthirsty Cocobites aspired to do. No, this was brought unto the unworthy world, or rather into the unworthy world, by pure grace through the crucified Messiah, for eternal righteousness and salvation, as Gabriel here declares. As was said before, this saying is too rich. The whole New Testament is summed up in it. Consequently, more time and space would be needed to expound it fully. At present, it will suffice if we are convinced that it is impossible to understand this statement as referring to any other Messiah or King than our Lord Jesus of Nazareth. This is true also for the reason that at that time, in the last week, no other Messiah than this was killed. For as Daniel's words clearly indicate, there must be a Messiah who was killed at that time. And finally, also, Haggai's saying fits no one else. For from Haggai's time on, there was not one who might with the slightest plausibility be called the Chemdath of all the Gentiles. Their delight and consolation, except this Jesus Christ alone. For 1,500 years, the Gentiles have found their comfort, joy, and delight in him. As we perceive clearly, and as the Jews themselves confirm with their cursing to the present day, for why do they curse us? Solely because we confess, praise, and laud this Jesus, the true Messiah, as our consolation, joy, and delight, from whom we will not be parted or separated by weal or woe, in whom and for whom we will confidently and willingly live and die. And the more the Jews, Turks, and all other foes revile and defame him, the more firmly will we cling to him, and the dearer we will be to him. As he says, Blessed are you when men revile you and persecute you on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great 
in heaven. All praise and thanks, glory and honor be to him, together with the Father and the Holy Spirit, the one true and veritable God. Amen. So long an essay, dear sir and good friend, you have elicited from me with your booklet in which a Jew demonstrates his skill in a debate with an absent Christian. He would not, thank God, do this in my presence. My essay, I hope, will furnish a Christian, who in any case has no desire to become a Jew, with enough material not only to defend himself against the blind, venomous Jews, but also to become the foe of the Jews' malice, lying and cursing, and to understand not only that their belief is false, but that they are surely possessed by all devils. May Christ, our dear Lord, convert them mercifully and preserve us steadfastly and immovably in the knowledge of him, which is eternal life. Amen.